All right, in chapter six, we're going to talk about elasticity, a very important concept in economics. Um, elasticity essentially uh, measures a buyer's responsiveness to price change or a seller's responsiveness to a price change. So we will start with price elasticity of demand, which measures buyer's responsiveness to price change. Okay, so we know that with the law of demand, that as price goes up, quantity demanded um, goes down, and as price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. Okay. So, but how much does uh, quantity demanded change in response to a change in price? Okay. If the cost of uh, food goes up, how much will you change your demand versus if the cost of, let's say, um, tennis shoes goes up? Okay, which one are you more responsive to with the price in, with the change in price, excuse me? Okay, so if you're very sensitive to a change in price, um, we say that your demand for that good is elastic. So whatever percentage change the price uh, changes, your quantity demanded will change by more than the percentage change in the price. So let's say price went up by 2% and your quantity demanded fell by more than 2%, then we will say that demand is elastic. It's sensitive to a change in price. Inelastic demand um, means that quantity demanded changes little compared to the change in price. So let's say price went up by 2% and your quantity demanded only went down by 1%, for example then we'll say that demand is inelastic. It's not too sensitive to price changes. Okay. So here we have the formula for price elasticity of demand. It's percentage change in quantity demanded of product X divided by percentage change in price of product X. Okay. Okay. So take a second to write this formula down if you have not. And Let's talk a little bit about how you would calculate the percentage change. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit different um, than the traditional we've been doing it. The way we've been doing percentage change is new minus old divided by old. So in the old way, it would have been new price minus the old price divided by the old price times 100. Okay, the problem is, though, is that it gives us inconsistent results. So so let's have an example where uh, price one is five, price two is two. Okay, so five minus two, okay, divided by two. Okay, this gives us three halves, which is a Okay, which is 1.5 times 100. Okay, it's 150%. Okay, change in price. Okay, however, what if we do the other way? Let's say price went back up from 2 to 5. Okay. Just erase this here. Okay. Okay. And instead, we did new price two minus the old price of five divided by the old price. Okay. We get. 3 fifths here times 100 gives us a change of 60%. Okay, and we report all numbers absolute, so it won't be negative 60%, it'll be 60%. Uh, okay, so the problem here is that going from price 1 to 
price two gave us a change of 150%, but going from price two to back to price five gave us a change of 60%. And what we want is to have consistent results where the change from price one to price two is the same as the change from price two to price one. And we do that using the midpoint formula. So this is what we do instead, okay. Okay, so we would do, for example, okay, let's let's say uh, quantity one is ten, quantity two is seven. All right. Price one is five, price two is two. Okay. Okay. All right, so the change. The percentage change in quantity using the midpoint formula here would be, for example, okay, let's do 10 minus 7 divided by 10 plus 7 divided by 2. Okay, so this would give us 3. Divided by, okay, so 10 plus 7 is 17. Divided by 2, okay, we get 8.5. Okay, and 3 divided by 8.5 gives us 0.353 once we multiply it by 100. Can you do here? Okay, it gives us 35.3%. Okay. Now let's do the midpoint formula to find the percentage change in price. First, we could say. Okay, so again, five minus two divided by five plus two divided by two. Okay, it's the midpoint between, this will give us the midpoint between five and two. Okay, we have 3 divided by 7 divided by 2 is 3.5. Once we multiply this by 100, okay, then we will get, okay, about 85.7%. Now that we have found the percentage change, we can plug these two numbers inside the um, price elasticity of demand formula and get the elasticity of demand. Okay. Okay, so 35.3 divided by 85.7. Okay, and we got uh, elasticity of demand of 0.41. All right, okay, so we use percentages so it can free us from units. So for example, you know, um, 
you know, we won't have to worry about whether price is measured in quarters, in dollars, in pennies. Um, also, it helps us compare elasticities across uh, products. You know, a one dollar change um, is going to not have a big of an effect if the item is already um, an expensive item. So, for example, a dollar change um, in the price of a house is not going to have the same effect as a dollar change, for example, in of your burger, okay, or your coffee. It's difficult to compare those two, but when we use percentages instead, then um, we can compare consumer responsiveness easier by saying, okay, a dollar change um, in the house caused quantity demanded to change by this much percent, or a dollar change in your burger caused quantity demanded of the burger to change by this much percent versus a change by this many houses or this many burgers, for example. And also we eliminate the minus sign um, because, you know, the downward, uh, the, excuse me, the demand curve is sloped downward, which implies an inverse relationship between price and quantity. We know that when price goes up, quantity demand it goes down, and when price goes down, quantity demand it goes up. So we don't need um, a positive or a negative sign uh, to tell us this. So we just compare it all as absolutes um, and makes it much easier. Okay, touched upon this earlier, but um, let's work a little bit on the interpretation of elasticity of demand. In our last example, elasticity of demand was less than one. Okay, so we it was um, 0 0.41 to be exact. So, you know, we could say for every 1% change in the price, then um, quantity demanded changes by 0.41%. Okay, so anytime elasticity of demand is less than one, then that means that quantity demanded changes less than the change in price. So if a uh, change in price, let's say price went down by 5%, then quantity demanded will go up by less than 5%. Or if price went down by 5%, then quantity demanded will go up by less than 5%. So that means that the good is not very responsive to a change in price. Okay. If demand is elastic, then the number will be greater than one, and that means that quantity demanded responds by a higher percentage change than um, a change in price. So, for example, let's say price went up by five percent, and quantity demanded went up by uh, that went down by seven percent. Then that means demand is elastic; it's very uh, be responsive to a change in price. If price went down by 3% and quantity demanded went up by 5%, again, we will say that demand is elastic. So anytime um, quantity demanded uh, changes more than the change in price percentage-wise, then demand is elastic and the number will be greater than 1. And if quantity demanded changes by the same percentage points as price does, then we'll say that demand is unit elastic and that it is equal one. So if price goes up by 5% of the good, then quantity demanded goes down by 5%. Okay, it'll be 5% divided by 5%, which equals one. There are some extreme cases um, if Elasticity of demand is zero. That means demand is perfectly inelastic. It means it's not responsive to a change in price. Um, this is a very rare scenario. Um, you know, one can think of, for example, if you are a type one diabetic and you need insulin to survive, then your demand for insulin is gonna be near perfectly inelastic. I mean, if the price goes up, price goes down, you know, you're not gonna change your demand for insulin very much. And then the other extreme is where demand is perfectly elastic. This is uh, when elasticity of demand equals infinity. This is a very 
this rarely ever occurs and if it did occur it's usually under the perfectly competitive uh, market structure where the goods that being sold are largely uh, the same over there where any change in price causes um, demand to go basically from zero to trying to obtain as much as the good as they possibly can. We have here a graph for the perfectly inelastic demand. So again, an example of this could be um, insulin. So price goes from, let's say, P1 to P2, it increases. However, your demand for insulin does not change. It stays the same. And the same if price goes back down from P2 to P1, your demand for insulin stays the same. And the other extreme is perfectly elastic demand where a price increase will cause demand go to go from infinite to zero. Okay. So why do firms want to know um, the elasticity of demand for their product? Okay. And this is because a price change can affect their total revenue. All right. So, you know, let's say you own your own business. Um, I remember my wedding photographer, okay, um, he owned his own photography business, and he was considering increasing his prices for weddings. However, he knows the law of demand, and he knows that with the price increase, um, quantity demanded will fall a bit. Okay, and he wants to know how much a price increase would impact his bottom line. Would it, you know, because here we have the price effect versus the quantity effect. Okay, so he knows that if he increases price, then he will earn more per unit. So in other words, more per wedding. Um, but he also knows that there will be less weddings, okay? And so here, you know, total revenue is price times quantity, okay? So if demand is inelastic, then he will be able to increase his price and also increase his total revenue. Why? Because consumers will not be as sensitive to a change in this price. So quantity demanded will change by less than the change in price. So he will have a higher total revenue. However, if demand for his product is elastic, then an increase in price will change quantity demanded enough. Okay, it will drop quantity demanded enough where he will actually earn less money and will move um, as price rises, total revenue will fall. So this is an example of demand being elastic. Okay, um, a rule of thumb here is, is that the flatter the demand curve is, the more elastic demand is. So when we looked at a few graphs back um, to perfectly elastic demand, it was a horizontal um, demand curve and then a perfectly inelastic demand curve was vertical. So the flatter the demand curve is, the more elastic demand is, and the steeper the demand curve is, the more inelastic demand is. So here we have a pretty um, flattened demand curve, so demand's elastic. And we see here, okay, that a change in price from $2 to $1, and I do not know why this graph did not load properly in here, but it's supposed to be from $2 to $1, okay, causes quantity to go from 10 units to 40 units, okay? So if we were to do the midpoint formula here to find the elasticity of demand, okay, this is a good time to do this example. So first we have to do our percentage change in quantity demanded 
and our percentage change in price. So percentage change and quantity demanded. Okay, so we could do 40 minus 10. Remember, it doesn't matter if you start with 40 or with 10. You're going to get the same answer since we're using the midpoint formula. All right, so 40 plus 10 divided by 2. Okay, so we get 30. The bottom will be 50 divided by 2 divided by 25. Okay, times 100. We get 120%. Okay. Okay, and now let's do percentage change in price. Okay, so we could do 2 minus 1 divided by 2 plus 1 divided by 2. Okay, so we get 1 divided by 3 divided by 2. That gives us 1.5. Okay, times 100 and we get 66.67%. Okay, so we plug this into the elasticity of demand formula. Okay, so we have percentage change in quantity demanded 120 divided by percentage change in price. Okay, and we're going to get a number that is greater than 1. We get 1 1.8. Okay, so we know here that demand is elastic for sure. It is sensitive to a change in price. Okay, so whenever this company drops its price from 2 to 1, okay, uh, quantity demanded goes up that the total gain, okay, exceeds the total loss. Okay, so there's going to be a gain in output, okay, that's by the blue, and that area is greater than the loss that is incurred by selling these units uh, for a lower price per unit. Okay, so it's less revenue per unit because now um, the firm is earning only one dollar per unit instead of two dollars per unit so there's a little bit of a loss there okay but that's the price effect that's the orange but there's the gain in the output effect and that's the blue okay but the reverse okay situation with elastic demand is this okay so remember with elastic demand um, price and total revenue move in different directions. So the example I gave you is price going from 2 to 1, so the blue area is the gain, so total revenue goes up. However, if price were to go from 1 back up to 2, then total revenue would fall, okay, because um, the output effect is stronger than the price effect, okay, and output would drop dramatically enough, okay, to lower total revenue okay also we can do the math um you know when price was two dollars we sold 10 units so that's total revenue of 20 when price is one dollar we sold 40 units so total revenue was 40 so we could see here that um, demand is elastic because when the price changed then total revenue when the price went down total revenue went up and then when price goes back up, then total revenue goes down. So it has that opposite relationship we talked about earlier. Okay. And here we have an example with inelastic demand. Okay. So when price is $4, um, this firm sells 10 units and total revenue is 4 times 10, so $40. And when the price is $1, should be at $1. Um, the firm sells 20 units, and so total revenue is 20. So what we see here 
is that a decrease in price also leads to a decrease in total revenue. And we said when demand's inelastic, then price and total revenue move in the same direction. So this firm would do better by keeping their prices higher because total revenue is higher when their prices are higher. So their good is in demand. Changing the price doesn't change quantity demanded very much. So they should um, keep their price at $4 over here. Um, so if the firm started out at $1 a unit, um, they could increase the total revenue by going by increasing the price to four dollars a unit. In this case, let me draw the line. And for unit elastic demand, in this case, um, total revenue does not change since you know percentage change in price causes quantity demand to change by the same percentage change then um, total revenue and stays the same. The output effect and the price effect are equal here. So whether price is at three or price is at one, uh, total revenue will not change. Price is at three, they'll sell 10 units, that's $30. Price is at one, they'll sell 30 units. Again, total revenue is $30. Now there are price ranges that are more elastic than others. Okay, so it's not always that a product is fully elastic or inelastic um, at all price ranges. So here we have price per movie ticket. And we see here at lower prices, um, demand is not very elastic. It's not very responsive to a change in price. We can see here that it's less than one. Okay, so if a movie ticket was $1 and it went to $2, okay, it's probably not going to make a huge dent in someone's wallet. Um, they'll probably still buy the movie ticket. But as price increases, okay, and, um, you know, we might not be willing to buy a movie ticket for, let's say, $8. Um, and so people are more sensitive to demand at higher price ranges than at lower price ranges. So I like to think of this more... Let's say this was my coffee, okay? Um, my demand for coffee is pretty inelastic. I kind of need it to function. So if I went from one to two dollars, I'm still gonna buy it, two to three, I'm still gonna buy it. But once it starts getting higher than three, I might not buy as much. I might go just to just one a day or maybe downgrade my size. And if my coffee were eight dollars, then you know, pretty much it would maybe be just a once in a while treat my demand would drop off significantly okay so starbucks raises the price of my coffee by 10 cents probably won't uh, deter me or keep me away starbucks triples the price of my coffee then yes i will definitely increase my demand also notice here that um, when demand is inelastic, as price increases, total revenue increases as well, okay? But as we go to the price range where demand becomes elastic, then the increase in price causes total revenue to decrease. Okay, if we were to illustrate our prior table in graph form, this is what it would look like, okay, so price ranges one to four. Price elasticity of demand is inelastic, okay, and then price ranges four to five. Price elasticity of demand is unit elastic, and then greater than five, price elasticity of demand is in elastic okay and so once again how does this affect total revenue as price rises from one to two to three dollars um, prices to city demand is still inelastic and so price and total revenue are moving in the same direction 
So it is going up. Once we hit uh, four dollars, then um, our total revenue peaks, and we price elasticity of demand is unit elastic. And then after five dollars, price elasticity of demand is elastic. It's very sensitive to a change in price, and total revenue starts to drop. All right, this is a great summary of price elasticity of demand. Okay, so, you know, if demand is elastic, that means quantity demanded changes by a larger percentage than this price. Total, total revenue decreases whenever there's an increase in price, and total revenue increases whenever there's a decrease in price. Um, whenever um, elasticity of demand is unit elastic, then total revenue is unchanged whether there's a price increase or price decrease. And then if it's inelastic, total revenue changes um, the same direction that price does. So price rises, total revenue rises, price drops, total revenue drops. What are the determinants of price elasticity of demand? What determines um, if demand for a good okay, is elastic or inelastic? Okay. So if a good is very, um, if a good can be substituted, then demand for that good tends to be more sensitive to a change in price. So for me, okay, um, I don't mind if I drink Coke or Dr. Pepper. To me, they're almost the same. So if Dr. Pepper is on sale one week at the store and it's cheaper than Coke, I will buy more of uh, Dr. Pepper and less of Coke. Okay, so my demand for these goods are elastic because there are lots of substitutes available. Okay, whereas if you look at something like sunscreen, okay, I wear sunscreen every day. It's good for you. Um, it helps prevent skin cancer, um, premature aging, etc. There's not really a lot of substitutes for sunscreen. I mean, you can wear a hat. Um, I don't really like wearing hats too much. So my demand for sunscreen is pretty inelastic because there aren't a lot of close substitutes um, to it. So if a good has a lot of substitutes, then it will be more, the demand for it will be more elastic, more sensitive to price changes than if a good does not have a lot of substitutes. Also, what proportion of your income is this good? So my Coffee compared to my income, you know, if we we're going to look at it as a percent, you know, how much my $2 coffee is, you know, is a very um, small proportion of my income. So, you know, if my coffee were to go up from $2 to $2.10, for example, um, you know, my demand for my coffee will not change. So it's pretty inelastic. Okay. However, if I'm looking at buying a house and the house price goes up from, let's say, $200,000 to $230,000, well, you know, that extra $30,000 um, can definitely make or break my decision and I'm much more sensitive to it. Um, so, um, you know, the higher cost the item is and the more elastic demand tends to be. So, for example, if something is a luxury, then it, you know, an increase in the price of the luxury item will greatly reduce my demand for that item. Um, I don't need it. You know, it's nice to have it, but you know, I don't need to have it. However, you know, changes in price of gas, um, basic necessities like you know, toothpaste, toothbrushes, floss, okay, uh, sunscreen, okay, um, changes in those items aren't going to reduce my demand so much because. I need those items, um, they're necessities. Also, um, the time period. Okay. Demand for a good is always more elastic in the long run than in the short run. Okay, in the short run, when gas prices um, go up, you know, I might not have enough time or resources to, um, for example, move somewhere where I don't need a car anymore, okay, or um, buy a Tesla, 
for example, where I won't need gas at all. But in the long run, okay, I can save up my, you know, I would have had enough time to either move to a place where I don't need um, to have a car anymore, or I would have saved up enough money to buy a Tesla. Of course, I'm talking about their model that's going to probably come out in 2017. That's um, a little bit more in the affordable range. Okay, so we see here some products. Okay, so we see that things that people consider um, a little bit more necessities, like major league baseball tickets, okay, the demand is inelastic. Um, so bread, electricity, newspapers, sugar, medical care, eggs. Um, I do find it interesting that medical care is more sensitive to a change in price than major league baseball tickets, but it is what it is, okay? But as things go from being a necessity to a little bit more of a luxury, like a motor vehicle, beef, <laughs> uh, China, for example, um, then, you know, it tends, um, price elasticity of demand tends to become elastic. Okay, some applications. Um, you know, the demand for farm products is usually inelastic. You know, it's food. Food's considered a necessity. Um, so it's pretty highly inelastic, actually. So whenever a farmer has a great growing season or produces a lot of crops, um, the prices of the farm products tend to go down um, because, you know, increased supply lowers the price and which also lowers the total revenues of farmers. So there have been government policies um, aimed at actually restricting farm output so that way um, farmers can have higher total revenues and stay in business. Okay, let's look at excise taxes. This, you know, these are taxes on um, products and the government usually chooses products that have inelastic demand. That way, um, you know, they can increase the price through a tax and they know that uh, demand will not change too much. And so they can still, um, that, and when quantity demanded stays about the same, then they know that, you know, the output that sells, the tax money that will bring in will be good tax money. So... Some examples are um, taxes on liquor, gasoline, and cigarettes, okay? Um, you know, it's been shown that increases in prices of liquor, gasoline, and cigarettes um, don't change quantity demanded that much, so the government can impose a tax. People still buy relatively the same amount, and the government makes um, good tax revenues from it versus if they were to tax something that's a little bit more of a luxury item, you know, when they, you know, consumers were sensitive to the change in price, then quantity demanded would fall to the point where, you know, government wouldn't make as much tax revenue. They'll definitely make more tax revenue by taxing items that are, uh, that have inelastic demand than elastic demand. And we also have the decriminalization of illegal drugs. Okay, so right now the war on drugs focuses on reducing the supply of drugs. However, Demand for drugs is real, is inelastic due to addiction issues. Um, addicts will find a way to get their hands on drugs. You know, if they run out of money, they resort to stealing. Um, and so when the government focuses on reducing the supply of drugs, well, when we reduce the supply, what happens to the price? Price goes up, drugs become more expensive, and therefore addicts turn to more criminal activity um, to fund their habit. And so um, some economists have said that, you know, if drugs were legalized, then um, prices would drop and therefore um, criminal activity would also drop as well. All right, moving on to price elasticity of supply. Okay. And... And this measures sellers' responsiveness to price changes. And so 
if supply is elastic, then producers are very responsive to a change in price. If it's inelastic, um, they're not as responsive to in price. Okay, so the formula is percentage change in quantity supplied of product X divided by percentage change in price of product X. Okay, so it's very similar to the formula for price elasticity of demand, except instead of doing percentage change in quantity demanded, we're going to do percentage change in quantity supplied for the numerator. Okay, but the way we find percentage change is the same. You know, we will use the midpoint formula. Okay. So, if elasticity of supply is greater than 1, then supply is elastic. Um, you know, just the same as it is with demand. If it's greater than 1, then demand's elastic. If elasticity of supply is greater than 1, then supply is elastic, meaning that um, quantity of supply changes by more than the change in price. Okay, so for example, if price were to go up by 2% and quantity supplied were to go up by 5%, then we would say um, supply is elastic. Okay, if supply is inelastic, then quantity supply changes by less than um, the percentage change in price. So if price were to go up by 5% and quantity supplied were to go up by 2%, for example, um, then we would say supply is inelastic. Okay. And if percentage change in price changes the same as a percentage change in quantity supplied, then we'd say that supply is unit elastic. And if elasticity supply is zero, then we say supply is perfectly inelastic. Um, any type of price change will cause um, no change in supply. So price goes up, price goes down, supply stays, quantity supplied stays the same. Okay. What is the determinant of um, elasticity of supply? And this is time. Time is the primary determinant. Um, in the immediate market period, supply is very inelastic. Um, you know, production has already begun. Um, products are already out there, and if there's a change in price, but the products have already been um, produced, then the firm needs to sell these products, whether price is high or price is low. They're already on the market. Um, as time goes from the immediate market period to the short run, okay, supply is still inelastic in the short run, um, but not as inelastic as in the intermediate market period where, you know, firms are able to change very little at that time. So in the short run, um, you know, it's hard for firms to expand their plant capacity, um, you know, to a to build a new factory, for example, to get a lot more equipment. Um, but, you know, they do have time to, for example, if there's, if there's greater demand for their product, then, you know, if their factory was not at full capacity, then they can um, use it at full capacity to produce more goods and services. However, if it's already at full capacity, the short run's not enough time for the firm to build a whole new factory or a whole new operation center. And this is where we go to the long run. In the long run, um, elasticity of supply is elastic because there is enough time for changes to be made. Um, you know, firms can expand their capacity and supply more. Also, firms can, um, you know, the demand for their good is not so high, then firms can sell off some of their factories and only keep a couple and decrease um, their supply there significantly. And so the long run, supply will always be elastic. And in the short run, in the immediate market period, it will be inelastic. So we have here an example of uh, perfectly inelastic supply. We can look at the immediate market period. Supply has already been set. So let's say there's been an increase in demand for that product. Price will rise, um, but the 
products have already been produced, and so uh, quantity supply is not able to be altered. They'll just sell that output at a higher price per unit. Okay, in the short run, um, supply can be altered um, a little bit more, so an increase in demand will cause firms to increase their su quantity supply by a little bit. Um, but they might not have the capacity to increase supply much more. They would need uh, more time to you know, hire more labor, build more factories, increase production. We have the long run, okay, where an increase in demand causes um, a great increase in quantity supplied as well. It's elastic. And also notice here that in the immediate market period, supply is vertical. It is steep, showing in elasticity. In the short run, um, the supply curve is not vertical, but it's still very steep, showing, again, in elasticity. But here, um, the supply curve is a little bit more flat. And so, again, the flatter the supply curve is, the more elastic supply is. Some applications. Um, so antiques are very inelastic. They cannot be reproduced. There is only a certain amount of antiques around the world so a change in price um, usually won't cause supply to increase significantly why because they can't be produced now what a change in price could do you know if someone's willing to buy an antique for a great amount of money then a person might be willing to sell that antique piece um for the high you know for that at that higher price but since they're not able to be um, we produce, you know, supply is inelastic. I mean, a higher price doesn't necessarily um, increase the supply of antiques greatly. Now, for reproductions, okay, um, you know, there's a lot of pieces out there, you know, whether it's furniture or some type of decorative figurine, etc., that can be produced to look like a figurine, that supply is elastic because it's not one of a kind and it can be easily reproduced. So quantity supply is more sensitive to a change in price. You know, higher prices will cause an increase in quantity supply. Lower prices will cause a firm to not reproduce as much. Okay. Also, Let's look at gold prices. Gold prices tend to be very volatile. During um, times of economic uncertainty, people tend to flock to gold. You know, they worry about maybe the uh, economy collapsing, dollars not being worth as much, and at least, you know, gold always has intrinsic value and they can uh, use it to buy goods and services. And then during good economic times, people don't buy as much gold. So, you know, gold is still a scarce resource. It's not um, widely available. It's a limited um, resource. And also, the process of mining gold is very time-consuming and costly. Okay. So, uh, gold is very inelastic. It's, you know, prices go up and prices go down, but the quantity of supply is inelastic because of those reasons. One, it's um, and limited resource, and two, it takes a lot of time and money to extract gold, or to mine gold. So when prices shoot up, um, it's not like the supply of gold um, increases significantly, and when prices go down, again, it's not like the price of, I mean, the supply of gold drops significantly either. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, further applications. Um, this is cross-elasticity of demand, okay? And this is basically, okay, how a change in the price of one product causes you to change your demand of another product, okay? So, for example... I talked a little bit about uh, Coke and Dr. Pepper earlier, okay? And once again, to find the percentage change in quantity demanded of product X and the percentage change in price of product Y here, we will use the midpoint formula. 
so for elasticity, any percentage change calculation, we will use the midpoint formula. Just you know, a little reminder here. Um, so let's say the price, let's say product Y is Dr. Pepper. And let's say the price of Dr. Pepper were to go up. Then I would buy more of product X, which is Coke. Okay. So whenever... Um, cross elasticity of demand is positive. Then the two goods we're talking about are substitutes. Why? Because the percentage, because the change in one of the goods causes you to buy more of the other goods. So for me, the change in uh, Dr. Pepper causes me to buy more Coke. Okay. Let's do another example of substitute. Good. Let's talk about cereal and oatmeal. So let's say product Y is oatmeal and product X is cereal. Okay, so let's say um, oatmeal drops in price. Okay, since oatmeal is cheaper, I'm going to buy more oatmeal and buy less cereal, which is product X. So a percentage change in price of product Y, which is oatmeal, drops. So my percentage change in quantity demanded of product X also drops, which is cereal. Okay, and so once again, it's a positive number. They both um, go down. Now, what if cross-elasticity of demand is negative? Okay, um, that means the two goods are complementary goods. So let's look at peanut butter and jelly. Okay. So let's say peanut butter is product Y and jelly is product X. If peanut butter increases in price, then I will buy less peanut butter. And, there, and because I consume peanut butter together with jelly, then I will demand less jelly as well. Okay, so peanut butter goes up in price. And since I consume peanut butter together with jelly, I demand less peanut butter and less jelly, and this will cause a negative coefficient. Um, and any time cross-elasticity of demand is negative, then the two goods are complementary. If it is positive, then the two goods are substitute goods. Okay, just a little bit of a summary of cross-elasticity of demand we talked about it. You know, elasticity is positive, there's substitute goods. If it's negative, it's complementary goods. And if it's zero, that means, you know, the goods don't, um, they're independent. They don't have a relationship. They're not complements um, nor substitutes. Some applications, um, and I love this application that the book has about um, Coca-Cola is trying to decide um, should they lower or not lower the price of Sprite? Okay, and so what they want to know here is that if they lower the price of Sprite, are the goods um, substitute? So, you know, will the increased sales of Sprite um, take away from its sales of Coke? So people would drink more Sprite and less Coke. Okay, if they are strong substitutes, then yes, it will. People would drink more Sprite, but they will drink less Coke, and it will cancel out. You know, if it's a weak um, relationship, then, um, you know, some people might substitute Coke um, for Sprite, but it won't be strong enough where the sales will cancel out from each other. Also, should the government allow a merger if two companies are selling goods that are very similar? Uh, I remember when T-Mobile and Verizon wanted to merge, um, you know, they sell similar cell phone service. The government blocked it because they said it would um, take up too much of a market share. You know, T-Mobile cell phone service, you know, can be substituted for Verizon cell phone service. Um, and so if the two were to get together, it would, as one company, then that one company would eat up a large share of um, the market share for cell phones. Okay, income elasticity of demand, okay? This measures how um, 
quantity demanded of a good changes in response to a consumer's income. Okay. The formula for this will be percentage change in quantity demanded divided by percentage change in income. Okay. So if okay, a percentage change in income, let's say income goes up and you buy more of that good. So let's say for me, my income goes up, I buy more sushi, okay? This will lead to a positive income elasticity of demand. And that means um, sushi is a normal good, okay? Because normal goods, if your income goes up, you buy more of normal goods. If your income goes down, you buy less of normal goods, okay? However, if my income goes up and let's say I buy less ramen noodles, this leads to a negative coefficient and that means that ramen noodles for me are an inferior good. Okay, inferior goods are have an opposite relationship with your income. So if I were to lose my job, um, let's say I would buy more ramen noodles. Not that ramen noodles are an in inferior good for everyone, right? I just don't prefer them but they are very cheap okay so if I were to lose my job then I would buy more ramen noodles and income elasticity of demand would be negative okay um, so if income increasing causes the good to increase it's a normal good or if income decreasing causes the quantity demanded of that good to decrease it's a normal good. However, if income increasing causes you to buy less of that good, it's an inferior good. Okay, so inferior goods, the coefficient will be negative for income elasticity of demand, and for normal goods, it will be positive. So products with high income elasticities, these are, um, for example, our luxury items, maybe in you a new car, um, jewelry, concert tickets, um, eating out, for example, they're most affected by a recession as our incomes go down. And the first products that we let go of or we stop buying are um, non-necessities, okay? Those products that have high income elasticities. Um, now, products that have low or negative income elasticity are not affected very much by a change in income so like if you know recession hits and our incomes fall, um, we still have to buy, for example, toothpaste and toothbrushes and groceries and water and gasoline, for example. So, um, you know, products that don't have or that have a low or negative income elasticity aren't hit so much by a change in income. All right, and so here's a good uh, summary slide for the cross and in income elasticities of demand. So we see here that for cross elasticity, if the coefficient is positive, then the goods are substitutes. If it's negative, they're complements. And for income elasticity, if the coefficient is positive, then goods are no more superior goods. So, you know, as our income goes up, we buy more of those goods. As our income goes down, we buy less of those goods. If the coefficient is negative, um, then the goods are inferior and the quantity demanded of that good goes in the opposite direction from your income. So firms do charge different prices um, to different consumer groups based on their elasticities. So for example, um, movies, um, they know, you know there's a senior citizen discount and a student discount. Why? Because they know that students and senior citizens tend to be on more limited income and so they want to be able to capture their business and they do so by charging lower prices since um, their demand for these goods are more elastic. It's more sensitive to changes in price. Um, also, um, we look at college tuition and um, people that, you know, there's some people that qualify for um, like Pell Grants, etc. whereas there's not as much funding for people that come from higher income um, families. Um, all sorts of places have children discounts. They know that families with children, um, you know, children do cost a lot of money and, you know, they might not 
be able to go to as many events or places if the price of ticket for children was the same as an adult. So in order to capture business of families, you know, either kids eat free or kids eat or kids can enter this park for just a couple dollars or whatever it is. Business air travelers are usually charged more because they know it's the company that is fronting the money versus leisure travelers. And so, you know, we can also call this a price discrimination where firms um, charge, discriminate between different um, consumer groups um, because they know they're they have different elasticities. All right, well, this concludes uh, chapter six.